Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I'm getting word here. Let's see. We're live. And okay, so we're also live for those following us along on uh, Covalent Careers as well. So welcome, everyone. Uh, you've got uh, myself, of course. I've been with you all day. And we <laughs> finally managed to wrangle Matt in I'm here. as well for a session. So Matt's with us as well. And we are excited to talk non-clinical optometry careers. I mean, I get messages and emails, um, you know, maybe not every day, but at least several times a week. Matt, I don't know about you. I mean, you mm -hmm. probably do as well. I'm sure. I think that it's an area people are heavily interested in. I'm pretty sure. I'm like every time we run our survey, survey every year, we ask this question right. and it's always over 50% uh, that uh, respondents are interested in non-clinical optometry roles. And I feel like that percentage just grows year over year over year. Who knows? Maybe it's even greater now with uh, everything, the current state of affairs and some other kind of technologies happening. But, um, you know, I think the goal of this whole talk was just to make this as much of a Q&A as humanly possible. It'll be far more engaging and entertaining. So if you're watching, uh, you can submit questions uh, directly in YouTube chat and we will answer them. Um, before we jump into it, uh, for those that have also been following along and uh, checking in and, and entering the raffle, we've got a raffle code for everybody raffle to code. collect. A raffle code, here it goes. Drum. Let me look at my list, drum roll. Da -da 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 -da. And the raffle code for this talk is sports. <laughs> that's capital S Who came up with that name? R T S. Well, you know, the idea when we came up with these raffle codes was to make it sort of uh, modality based. Uh, I don't want to give uh, away too many hints, though. I don't want to give too many hints away, but <laughs> yeah. uh, we figure sports vision, vision therapy, that kind of thing. So I got sports you. is the code. Uh, so enter that in. You'll get uh, entered into a couple other entries, I guess you can say. But um, you know, without further ado, let's uh, let's dive right into it. Um, you know, Matt, uh, you've got a unique story. I guess we both do. Why don't you Why don't you give everyone uh, an inside look into you know how you got started into non clinical optometry? Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Antonio. Uh, thank you to everyone who's attended to the attended the virtual career fair today. We had such a good showing. You guys crashed the live chat, so that was a uh, that was interesting. We got it back up and running though. Uh, and remember, please ask questions here on YouTube. Anything related to non-clinical careers, pretty much ask me anything. Happy to answer. Um, and with that, and if you're watching, don't go anywhere because I do have an exciting announcement that I'll announce in a little bit for a new product we're launching that can be useful in non-clinical careers. Uh, but anyway, I got started uh, in optometry school, just like many folks watching. That was back in probably 2009. And Antonio, you remember we were classmates and uh, wanted to just do online publishing. I mean, there was a lot of great publish publications out there, but I just didn't see anything in regards to students. I mean, there was no social media was barely a thing, you know. Um, uh, and, and certainly most publishing happened through print. There was a couple of digital ones. Um, and so started optometrystudents.com just to cover that whole, you know, kind of aspect of things. And it, it was it was incredibly successful. I think the timing was right. The American Optometric Association ended up acquiring it. That was a good piece on the timing side. Uh, and it was just a lot of fun. We wrote a lot of good content and um, you know, we're successful with it. And then uh, obviously I had four years pretty much of experience in online publishing and marketing, be that as it may, you know, I, I never had taken a marketing course, a web design course, business course, didn't know any of that. It was all self-taught. Uh, and then when I graduated in 2013, started newgradoptometry.com as a likely continuation, you know, speaking about the new grad side. Um, and, and granted, you know, we're, we're doing this very well now. So in a way, like those ships have sailed, although there is room, right, for more conversations and more publishing. And I, I think the future of this is kind of on social media. So, you know, individuals can really have their own kind of social media related blogs and things like that. Uh, but after gradoptometry.com got going, it became one of the largest online eye, pair, eye care publications. I mean, you know, major sponsors, uh, we're probably number one Alexa rank site. That means, you know, it's an SEO metric. Um, and really had an incredible readership base. Um, in addition, um, around that time, we started uh, Covalent Careers because we saw there was something missing on the job side of things. The job technology just wasn't very good. And shout out to Brett and Josh, the other co-founders. Uh, and, and we started you know, from scratch, covalentcareers.com, 
help on the job side. And, and it really, you know, became quite successful. We help more optometrists find jobs than any other company in eye care now. As you see, we've got virtual trade show technology. Uh, we've got, you know, 2000 or so articles on the site and uh, doing quite a lot of cool things. And, you know, those who are curious of what Covalent Careers has become, uh, we're about 15 people here in San Diego, in my office here. Um, and, you know, once about 20 people, the business model changed a little bit. Um, but anyway, we essentially are really a, a media and marketing agency. So we work with companies to help them with media and marketing agency kind of uh, support. And it just so happens that we were built, a uh, publication was kind of built around us, right? So that's how we're able to generate revenue. But, uh, you know, having the digital publication is the way that most folks come to us and we help other companies with media and marketing solutions. Um, so that's the gist of it. That's where we're at now. And uh, Antonio, you know the story well. Yeah, I do. I definitely know the story pretty well. I mean, I was lucky enough to be sitting next to you all throughout uh, optometry school. So I kind of was able to, to hop on the train, the non-clinical train. And, you know, I, I learned a lot of stuff along the way as well. You know, a lot of things, obviously you taught me and then, you know, some self-teaching, of course, and learning new things every day. So definitely a lot of fun uh, and, you know, doing non-clinical things for sure. I know that a lot of people always ask, well, you know, what kind of uh, non-clinical opportunities are there? You know, what can I do? And, you know, I think there's some common ones, maybe some less common ones, and maybe some, some new kind of opportunities probably opening up as technology advances, as social media, Matt, I think you said that's a big one, starts to kind of really take off or take off further. Um, so, you know, I guess, you know, Matt, what are the top kind of uh, non-clinical rules that come to your mind when you think of non-clinical optometry? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's kind of a spectrum of how far you want to deviate from clinic. So, for example, Synergize, a partner of ours, they were recently looking for, um, you know, someone to be in a non-clinical role, but also have some clinical focus, but out of their corporate headquarters in San Diego. And, you know, that individual was supposed to, you know, uh, run some trials, work on new uh, synergized product, all that type of stuff. And so like, you know, they're very much running uh, studies and in meetings and doing that type of stuff, but also obviously, you know, putting lenses on eyes. So, and then also you have at the other end, I mean, I don't do any clinical work other than a mission trip here, but uh, media marketing leading finance, all that day in, day out stuff here. So it depends first, right? There's a spectrum. And so, you know, there's like healthcare administration, there's large practices, large facilities that need someone to help run the operations. A lot of the, you know, great uh, uh, exhibitors at today's uh, event, like my eye doctor and NVI, you know, look at the leadership at those companies. Those are ODs. There's a lot of ODs there. And those individuals are, you know, operational management, leadership. And what does that mean? And that's an interesting question. Go ask them in the chat and they'll get back to you. But, you know, there are roles like that. <clears throat> you get into practice management consulting well, if you've been in private practice or have a lot of unique ideas around that, or perhaps your past life, you're able to bring some skill you had like marketing or social or whatever it is into practice, right? Um, freelancing. I mean, we compensate quite a lot of writers to do their own written content for us. Now, granted, that's not going to be a full-time job or even a part-time job, but it will help you add additional income. Uh, CE lecturing is very similar, but it's spoken, right? Perhaps in that regard, you're getting paid a little bit more for a course, but once again, there's some very successful folks out there. You can see them kind of published everywhere, but they generate a significant amount of income from CE slash writing slash speaking slash consulting, that type of stuff. Um, then there's just, there's obviously your more traditional paths like becoming a professor or, you know, um, kind of being in clinic, but not seeing patients full time, more so teaching, educating, that type of stuff. Recruiting is really popular. Go and chat with the folks at the specific booths we have today in the exhibit hall, and you'll meet a lot of folks who are ODs and do recruiting, right? Well, you got three recruiters on staff here and, uh, you know, those individuals are not ODs, but, uh, you know, you can certainly be a very successful recruiter in that regard. Yeah. Then I think you get into kind of the interesting, more entrepreneurial side, which is kind of create your own path, pave your own way. And I don't think you necessarily need experience, but having something can give you an edge. Uh, and most certainly there, you can absolutely pave your own way. Now, what should you pave or where should you go? Well, I don't know where the future lies. Only you know, right? So that's where you have to be a visionary and say, well, what does this profession need? What is, how much risk do you want to take? Uh, 
to go forward with it. Keep in mind, please ask questions here on YouTube. Oh, we got it. Yeah, we got it. We got a question that popped in. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll propose this to you, Matt, but I think it's a really great question. And you kind of spoke uh, about some of these things, right? About, you know, those kind of the things that we started talking about in the beginning was social media. Um, that seems to be a very popular place right now, a, a lot of opportunity there. And, you know, the question is, is it's really hard to monetize social media in, in our space, in our sphere. What would your advice be for influencers uh, trying to monetize what they do? And, you know, maybe this goes back into Matt when you first started uh, sharing your story where there wasn't a lot in the whole publication space. It was kind of, you know, right place, right time, right. Uh, timing thing. Whereas now, yeah, social media is really popular. But with that, there's a lot of people who do social media now as well. Yeah. So, you know, any tips on how to monetize that um, space? Yeah, I think that the social media space for eye care is just getting started and not to knock some of our clients or to knock clients that are in a or, or companies that are similar to our clients. But we find that many eye care companies are slow to adopt new marketing tactics. And I think that's the nature of healthcare. I think that actually optometry is a little bit faster at acquiring or starting to work through new marketing tactics because it does have a retail component to it. So it's far, you know, optometry is further along than some other more, uh, you know, than other, other healthcare fields. But be that as it may, I think to answer Emily's question, it's going to take a little bit more time. She's saying, you know, after two years, still trying to monetize social is tricky. And, you know, I think it, I think it's going to take more time. And we're also helping to, to help propel and push that forward. When I look at the landscape of marketing and I think of where is the biggest opportunity, I think that it's actually within the individual social media influencers and the, and, um, their ability to disseminate a message and do it in an authentic way. I mean, if you look out at the rest of the marketing landscape, every other brand is using social media influencers. So to say, well, why aren't they getting paid in optometry? Well, um, I think it's just a matter of time. I can I can actually talk about covalent creators here. It's actually a perfect time to to talk about this. Antonio, would you like well, like me to? Yeah, do that? go for it. Yeah, why don't why don't you why don't you give yeah. everyone an inside look at to some things that we've so been. So I'm going to share my screen here. Screens. Yeah, I think this is perfect time uh, to go over this because we felt that there was not a lot of monetization opportunity for social media influencers. So we wanted to put something together where we could start to actually us as a company pay influencers to put their message out there, starting in small increments and slowly growing it. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. This has been currently just invite only. But for those of you that would like to, uh, Antonio, can you see my screen? I can see your screen. Yep. So we launched a new brand called Covalent Creators, covalentcreators.com. It's iCare's first influencer platform, one of a kind community for ODs, ophthalmologists, techs, and iCare professionals. Um, what we basically do is pretty simple. You create an account, you fill in some of your interests and things like that, and then uh, we will contact you about projects that fit uh, what your background is. And obviously paying out on all of those or some contracts are, are you know, uh, just, you know, in good opportunities, but the majority of contracts actually pay out. So, you know, we work with the brands as an agency. You got to see some of them here, Allergan's, Ice J&J, Luxottica, my eye doctor, MDI. So uh, we bring those opportunities to you. We have writing opportunities, photography, speaking, live events, video, social media opportunities. Sean was on before, Tyler, uh, like a Soljuki, Dan Epstein, you can just see some of the work that we've done before. And we've worked with maybe a bunch of people who are watching this actually in the past, but we wanted a system to formalize it. So I'm just going to show you really quick, you know, my profile, kind of what this looks like behind the scenes. And once again, you could go ahead and register for this, but very simply, you can upload your photo, some information about yourself, uh, throw in a bio there. You can add all your clinical focuses, your practice settings in particular, languages you speak, links to work you've done before, some of the project preferences, like what are you interested in? Do you want to write about finance, grad school, you know, residency, whatever it might be? Media formats like calculators, contests, public speaking, quizzes, social media campaigns, surveys, whatever you like to do. And then the platforms that you use. Are you a LinkedIn person or you, uh, you know, want to use webinars? 
we have a whole you know slew more here of fields you could fill out on equipment types and brands and EHRs that you work for, and then of course some educational components. And then what you know very simply um, and and what's live right now is just the ability for us to see your profile and then contact you with projects. But very shortly, hopefully, Dev Team is going to kick me for this one. But hopefully, in the next few weeks, we will launch to you for you the ability to see all of the projects within the database. It's just we're rolling it out in phases. So Covalent Creators really is a fantastic way where you can create your own profile and we will contact you about projects that we have, you know, through these companies we work with. And like back to exactly what Emily said, we want to make this just a much more even playing field and landscape because co Emily, companies are coming to us saying, hey, can you help us with social projects? But they are having a hard time getting to you. And so we hopefully, you know, believe that this will be a nice kind of flow through to that. And uh, we'll get we'll get to that point where there's going to be, you know, hopefully hundreds of projects at any one point in time on the site. Now, with something without covalent creators, right, let's actually ask this a little bit more or let's go after this a little bit more, you know, head on. Well, you've got kind of cold outreach and then you've got like inbound, you know, people may recognize you and if they recognize you, you've got to be ready to strike with, you know, kind of like not necessarily a media kit, but sort of a plan of proposal. What do you charge for posts? What's the value? What's your follower count? All of that type of stuff. Um, and that is really key. Now, if you're going to go ahead and reach out to people, you need to kind of have your, your prospecting, your sales prospecting message down. Now, if I was reaching out to companies, I mean, I'd probably use platforms like LinkedIn. I would email social connection or email connections of mine to see if they can introduce me to folks in, in the marketing department and stuff like that. And I'd also for sure go to trade shows to talk with the folks at the booth and see, you know, um, particularly if maybe we can, if I could help them with some social media services. So if you've got five, six, 10,000 followers, um, I think you can certainly sell that as a service. Just remember that you've got to put some creativity behind it. Like when we work with social media influencers, which we do pretty regularly, um, although they're small budget amounts at this point in time, we like when social media influencers are really put their effort behind it. Not just going to say, I'm going to do a post and, you know, put you in the caption, but more so like, I'm going to do this very creative thing. That's how we got started. Antonio, if you remember, you know, back, it wasn't just, oh, we're going to write an article about you. It's like, no, we're going to do film. We're going to do webinars. We're going to do right. infographics. We're always pushing ourselves. So if you're a social media influencer, push yourself to the next level. How can you go above and beyond for your clients? Because that's what it is. It's your client to deliver value for them and keep your, inf uh, keep your fans also engaged uh, in the content you're creating. So use Covalent Creators, but at the same time, practice both an inbound approach. If someone comes to you, what do you have ready in terms of a proposal? And if that's not happening, you've got to go outbound. You've got to sell. Sales is the key, uh, especially in this situation. Yeah, so hopefully definitely. that helps, but go to covalentcreators.com to create your account. Yeah, super exciting. Uh, you know, a lot of folks are, are super excited about this, Matt. You know, some of the people that have uh, known, heard about it a little earlier, and then obviously a lot of chats coming in. Um, you know, Emily, uh, actually, uh, thanks for, for kind of clarifying, you know, for those that are watching, you know, what is a media kit, right? Uh, Matt, you had mentioned that before. And um, yeah, you know, Media Kit is how you can kind of break down the pricing of, I guess, in, in this regards, uh, social services or social posts, right. so to speak, that you offer. But, you know, Media Kit can also reflect uh, other things you do, depending on what kind of services you're offering. So uh, thanks for clarifying that. Um, you know, someone, someone just uh, asked a great question here, Matt. How, yeah, how do you determine how much you're worth? And, you know, when charging companies and brands. Yep. Well, I think there's two things. I mean, look, at the end of the day, media and marketing is coming down to not, you know, it's coming down to really the value you're able to provide the company. So, uh, Dr. Tone, if you're able to, if you're able to basically say, look, company X, I'm going to make you $500,000 in sales. If you can prove that you can make them $500,000 in sales, I don't know how you're going to do that, but if you can, and if you know, and if you did your work and you're able to track and you're able to do all that, your conversation is very different. You wouldn't say, hey, here's $50 for a social post. You'd, you'd have a discussion around the value you're creating for that company. Now, understanding you created them $500,000 in new sales is the difficult part, but there are ways to do it. Now, granted, that might be a very high number, but you potentially could help them with 10 or $20,000 in sales. Even that might be tricky. So the average company, I think, because it is hard to track and it is hard to know, is just going to say, look, we're not going to track this. We just want what's called brand equity. We want you to do whatever you got to do 
to get us hits to a website, follows on our social page. We just want brand equity. And in that case, then you kind of got a more, because it's very hard to, ju to judge how much value comes to a company from brand equity. I don't really like price or price tag on it, where amount of money they gain from brand equity. So in that type of situation, you really have to go to kind of what is the going rate, right? What is the going rate for a social post? Well, I think we're 10,000 followers and under. You're typically in a range of roughly under $200 or so for a pretty well done post, video, something like that. Um, I don't think there's really a well-established market for prices. I do think there is a well-established market in the beauty space, in the clothing space, in you know, pets and things like that. And for that, once again, do your research. There's platforms like Covalent Creators, but for other you know, influencers and individuals out there. There are certainly some guides out there as to what other people are charging, right? No, you know, don't go and look what Kylie Kendall, whatever her name is, Jenner makes, because <laughs> she's making millions off the post. That's like yeah. not really the way it goes. But you know, if you can start and say, look, a post is 50 bucks or a post is 200 bucks, or look, we're going to do something really kind of, it's going to be a whole half a day thing and it's going to be a takeover and that's going to be 300 or $500. It's okay to not have, to hit the nail on the head. You know how many times our company has priced stuff and we don't really not, we're not really sure where to begin. You know, we've come to a new place now where we understand what the market rate is or what the market can bear. And that's good. Then we're in a place where we can confidently charge a certain amount. Uh, but what I'd say is one, how much value are you providing, right? And then you basically need to charge a percentage of that. Uh, and number two, if you're not sure of that or you can't track that or you can't do that, it's more of a brand equity thing, I would look towards the going rate. And I don't actually, I haven't prepared something like that. We can, as we do Covalent Creators more, I think we'll put out guides like that. But I think you're looking at between roughly like 50 and 500 bucks for a pretty well done, fairly involved uh, you know, post. Yeah, but do not limit yourself on those numbers. I easily think you get into a thousand, two thousand, five thousand numbers. Uh, just make sure that the value is there. Uh, another thing, sorry, Antonio, if you're putting production value behind what you're doing, if it's you getting on the phone, that doesn't cost you much more than your time. But if you're going to get three ODs in your area and they each have to take an hour off of work, and you also know someone who has some pro lighting equipment. Like that glossy right there, that's the pro lighting equipment. Yeah. If you know that and you get the good camera, whatever it is, you're able to get that price up more because your production value is going to be higher. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, no, uh, you know, I'm looking at the lighting kind of on my video here and it looks so terrible compared to you. You've got like a nice tan going on. Maybe it's just the lighting, but it's the um, lighting. I yeah. got the golden light coming in. Yeah. A good question came in uh, from someone with a Heinz Ward uh, picture on their, on their profile there, uh, Ewan. So I I'm from Pittsburgh. So yeah, I'm a big Steelers fan as well. So we'll definitely got to answer this question Let's for you. Um, you know, the question is, is do you have any advice in getting your foot in the door for biotechs and pharmaceuticals? Um, we've been talking a lot about social media, Matt, um, but there's a whole nother world of non-clinical opportunities. And, you know, this is definitely one of them. Uh, yeah. You know, I don't know what your top tips are, but I know just kind of thinking back to, to some of the folks that I know in these these industries that have these roles and just chatting with them. And it's always been kind of like, well, you know, I just started writing um, yeah. for different publications or I just started doing speaking engagements and, you know, slowly the, these companies have kind of found me and then they've kind of led into to opportunities. But what do you, what about you? What have you found? Well, I'm about to make your life a lot easier. Let me find this link though. Use this search tool. Okay. Well, I'm not sure if this question is related to, social media influencers, but I don't think it is. I think this individual is asking just in general, how you get in, how do you get right. your foot in the door of biotech pharma? Please go ahead and let me know if I'm on the right track here. Well, it depends. I mean, number one, I think it's important to try to be in a place where these companies exist. May That may be putting like, that may be putting the cart before the horse. You may want to kind of put your feelers out, but I, I say that because like San Diego has got a ton of biotech pharma companies. Um, the big thing with bio, biotech and, and pharma Look, I mean, this, this question actually, it really depends. I don't know how if I should approach it from like a consultative perspective or a true full-time position. So let me do both. From a consultative perspective, being on ad boards, uh, writing copy, that type of stuff. Number one, you've got to use their products. I mean, if you're an expert in their product, they're going to get you on their advisory board. That's probably one of the first big steps. I'm on a few different advisory boards. I don't use products, but you know, I, I, I tend to have a pretty good awareness of the space, but put most folks on advisory 
advisory boards use products regularly. They are key accounts. They do a lot of business with that company. Not always. Sometimes these boards definitely want people with contrarian views or different ways of thinking. But being on an advisory board is one way to get your foot in the door. Um, but also just talking with, once again, marketing folks at these companies to say, hey, I'd love to do some writing for you. I'd love to be a KOL, a key opinion leader for you, right? So doing something that's going to create something for them, whether it's your spoken word in a meeting, like in an advisory board, or an article about their products or services. So from that type of perspective, I would think of it that way. If you want more people to ask who are experts in this, I would go to openpaymentsdata.cms.gov, which if you haven't ever been to this site and you're an OD, I'm posting it in the, in the YouTube right now, by the way. This will give you the ability to look up any physician name and see who paid them, right? I'm not going to put anyone on blast here, but we all know, obviously, everyone could go and search me. My page is all screwed up, so don't even look at mine. But <laughs> you can look yeah. these things up and you can see who is paying the ODs that you may know. And then at that point, perhaps you know some of those individuals, or perhaps you can start to see the types of companies that are doing open payment information. So this could help you to find a good mentor, maybe someone in your state or someone that you know, to find a connection. But remember, if you can't bring value to the table, if you can't provide something that's interesting, something that's new, you know, but keep in mind, if you're younger, like this talk, maybe there's a lot of millennials listening, just that younger audience, that younger mind is going to be of interest to these companies. So use the open payments data to find, you know, folks that you may know who may have intros to these companies and just ask a friendly intro. I've gotten friends of mine to be on advisory boards just by saying, hey, I think you should really talk to this person. Can you please repeat the link? Yeah. Uh, well, if you're typing in the YouTube chat, Dr. Newman, it's right above you, openpaymentsdata.cms.gov. Yeah. Um, but go to that link and you can kind of search search yourself, see how many dinners you got paid for from the companies. But anyway, <laughs> um, this is a great way to see it. Now, if the, if it's the opposite view, how do you get a full-time job at one of these uh, one of these places? Um, I think it's it's you can take a very similar approach, but at the end of the day, I, I think... Um, you have to try to understand the type of role you're going into. Um, co coronavirus really dis dismantled our whole plans for the year, but we did have plans to start working with companies to uh, enable ODs to find non-clinical positions at pharma companies and stuff like that. So our plans got all messed up, probably is not happening this year, uh, but obviously as the, the number one job site, we're equipped for that. And we've got a lot of good things that hopefully may happen by the end of the year. Um, but it's building connections, providing value, scouring the websites for the for the companies that you know are maybe close by and, and places where you have clinical, clinical experience to help out. Uh, but it certainly is possible. And uh, more, there is a high proportion of ODs in our space that have retired from clinical care and gone to other companies. Yeah, Matt, you brought up a couple of great points when you were when you were talking. It got me thinking, um, you know, it's interesting. And I think this question comes up a lot. Um, is that, for example, you had said, you know, if you use their product a lot, they'll find you. And I found that to be actually very true. I mean, I know a couple of people that have gotten non-clinical roles just because they prescribe a lot of, you know, a, a specific drop or drug or whatever. And mm -hmm. that company says, man, you know, we, we know that you use our product a lot. We'd love for you to, to lecture for us to get on our, our speaking circuit. And right. they've kind of done that. And then they grow into a bigger role. But, you know, I think the bigger question here then is, do you need to have a little bit of clinical experience before you jump into a non-clinical role? I mean, probably the answer is, is it depends, but uh, maybe for this type of position or this specific type of role that we're talking about, I mean, I'm sure that it helps rather than just trying to kind of start into a non-clinical role right as soon as you graduate. Yeah. You're you're 100 right. Having the back the the experience, whether it was you know, it doesn't have to be in the space of optometry, but having you know, if it's a marketing role, having marketing experience, if it's administration or management, having some of that, that's really valuable. But look, I mean, I, I, I don't think it's required. I think ambition, hard work, dedication, smart ideas, good plans, uh, that type of stuff is required. So I think it's pretty easy to convince a company of your value if you truly have it. If you don't have it, you're going to have a hard time coming up with what to put on the page. But even if you don't have the background experience, but your ideas and, and, and what you want to bring to the table is valuable, the companies will notice. But I wouldn't just say like, well, first thing I'm going to do is get my MBA. Then I'll figure out a non-clinical role afterwards. Like that wouldn't be my pathway because yeah. that is like, I like to try to sell it before I have to spend the money for it. 
you know? So yep. I'd rather talk to companies and let them know what I'm all about and show a lot of ambition. And then after the fact say, well, if you need me to get my MBA, we can talk about that. Or I will like get, if, you know, get some momentum in your favor first before you start to go and spend a ton of money or try to learn something that may not be what you need for a particular role. I think a lot of companies are willing to have conversations without a, an amazing resume. Benefits of getting an MBA here from Pooja, um, I think that there's a lot of folks who have gotten MBAs in the space, had success with it. Mm -hmm. um, Corey uh, ha Hanneken. Yeah, Hakenin. Yeah, Hakenin. he's uh, yeah, he definitely sticks out. Uh, definitely a, a good friend of ours, and um, yeah. you know, he's he's helped us out a lot over the years, just participating in talks like this. Uh, yeah. Maybe we'll maybe we'll have him jump on for another segment. But we've done a lot of videos with him where he shared a lot of advice around uh mba so we'll see right if you now. can yeah awesome for his and, author um, bio he's gotten his i think will yep. toe got his mba i'm not i'm sorry if i put him on blast there i think he may have but um i i think it's excellent I, some folks may not have the the they feel like they need the additional support and i think that's fine i i, I personally it's not for me i would never plan to get my mba rather yeah. than by getting punched I'm, in the face a bunch of times and learning business <laughs> lessons but <laughs> and I'm pretty sure, yeah, listening. and you guys can can check out Corey's story for sure. Definitely check it out. He's got a lot of good stuff that uh, he shares yeah. in a lot of the videos and articles, but I'm fairly positive, Matt, kind of going back to what you're saying. He kind of already was dabbling a bit in, in non-clinical roles even before he got his MBA. And, Correct. you know, he wanted to get his MBA a for, for a variety of different reasons. Um, but it just so happened that it kind of really helped him uh, get, you know, strengthen his foothold and what he had already started. So uh, if going I'm not back mistaken, to that, him or maybe someone else actually was an OD at my eye doctor or, or spot, I believe is my eye doctor. So go over there booth and chat with them. That'll make me happy. Um, and, and he started as an OD there, worked his way up at the company, learned a lot about leadership roles at the particular company, and then ultimately branched out from there. It could have been a exotic thing. I can't remember. It's way back. But honestly, oh, Brett's laughing. That's good. We got Brett laughing. Yeah. <laughs> um, one of the best things... I think if you're interested in non-clinical is to actually talk with some of the folks at our booth today. Yes, they're looking for ODs, but your non-clinical role may be a few years into the future. And those companies have, they have got quite a lot of staff and they're really looking for future good leaders. And those are great management leadership positions, I would say. Yeah, for sure. I, I definitely echo that sentiment. Um, you know, I don't, uh, let's see, do we got, uh, we got a keep, couple keep, more here yeah, to handle keep, Anna, Emily's here. Oh uh, yeah. Uh, go for it. Local sales reps, I think are excellent. To be honest, Emily, I've had local sales reps contact me that have led into large potential media deals. So I think if we, if, you know, if we can get entry through a local sales rep to someone else, that's, that's, uh, that means that you can too. Um, once again, I think it comes down to that email, right? That initial email and letting them know that one, you can provide to value. Two, um, that that like you have your your act together. You you know exactly what's needed. You know, you're cutting to the chase and you're saying, like, look, this is what we do, this is what I do on social, and not necessarily sending them a media kit, but you know, that it is a turnkey solution. It's easy for the company to get started. Let them know that the skids are greased, it's easy to work with you. You know, um, and then letting them know that you know who you need to talk to. Use LinkedIn. Purchase now LinkedIn Sales Navigator if you need to. The fifty bucks, hundred bucks, whatever it is, you'd be surprised who you can meet. Um, one hack that I did, it didn't totally pan out, but that's for different reasons. But I just pay attention to Vision Monday's email blast, and I look for who's in new CMO roles, who's the new chief marketing officer at each company when there's a new press release. Maybe it only happens two or three times a year, but then I hunt that person down congratulate them on their role because they deserve it, but then you've now found an in. So you've got to just find ways to get hacky and find your way in. Um, and that could be literally like any type of method. So it's not like it will not come to you because right now companies, I do not believe are engaging social media influencers outside of larger agencies. And so eventually they probably will go down to Main Street, so to say. And in order to get to them, your, in, your, your outbound approach, meaning you contacting them, you have to get hacky. Pick up the phone, hit LinkedIn Sales Navigator, ask questions to, uh, to connections of yours for maybe introductions. Uh, events. Hopefully there's more live events like this where you can also ask uh, for favors. Antonio, I'm going to turn up my AC, but keep going. I'm still Yeah, playing. no, for sure. I think we've got uh, another question that popped in. Do you guys by any chance need an extra help setting up the non-clinical end of the site? 
Um, is that something to explore through creators? Uh, you know, you can you can answer this, but I think probably uh, whenever we're ready for that, maybe, you know, and, and maybe we'll be leveraging uh, cre covalent creators for that. So I'd say check back. Eladonna, um, what, coding language do, what coding languages do you use? Let's There let's, you go, let's, let's find, find out. out. Um, any advice from a doctor living with an optometry degree from another country living in the US? What sticks out um, to me is probably research, Matt, and probably yep. research and teaching. Um, you know, we, we uh, have, have had professors as well who, who have that degree from another country that have taught us fantastic instructors, learned a ton. Yep. Um, and that probably sticks out. First thing that sticks out in my mind, I don't know. You've yeah, I think that days. most companies are going to need to start taking a global approach. They already do take a global approach, right. but you know, you're seeing, you're see, like I work with a lot of folks at companies who have global in their title and we focus on us and we don't really talk too much about global solutions, but when they do pop up, they're like, oh yeah, you're talking to the right person. So, you know, when it comes to that, I think that, um, U.S. companies, maybe based out of the U.S., but have a global business. They have certain key accounts in certain locations. So, you know, um, certain companies are going to work more in Asia versus India. Uh, it's technically the same thing. You know what I mean? But so, so you have to find which. You know, what's your interest? Wh where are you living, first of all, or what? Um, what other country are you from? What companies are doing key business there? And then what things can you bring to the table to help them in that area? Then reach out. That's a very unique value proposition to be in. I'm, I'm even interested. Where are you from? And kind of, you know, what is your expertise there? Because there's ways that we can kind of leverage that to, to help uh, these companies expand their global businesses. I think it's, I think it's a great one. Another Not good question route. came in here, uh, Matt. Uh, you know, Emily's asking, if you picked another non-clinical route outside of publications, uh, what would each of you choose to do? That's a, that's a great question. It's probably hard to imagine doing anything else, honestly. Um, but I'll go first, I guess, go because one thing that pops up into my mind is, um, you know, just speaking. I think I, uh, you know, I typically enjoy speaking, presenting. I get super nervous, actually, uh, even though I've, I've done a lot of it over the years, but I get super nervous, but I have such a good time doing it. So I'd probably look to do something in the role of lecturing, uh, you know, whether that's for a company or for school or, or something like that, university, optometry school, whatever, but something in that kind of realm, just teaching, educating, that sort of thing. Yeah, that is a good question, Emily. I don't know. I think I think I'm just a destined to be marketer or something. I mean, if it was slightly different, I don't know, something in the creative space. Um, Maybe teaching other optometrists to market. Yeah, yeah. Consulting in some, in some way. Um, that's tricky. Yeah, and I guess kind of the question is, is like, well, then what else is out there? I think that's a creative mm -hmm. way to say, well, what else is out there? What else can be done? Um, I think the answer would be to start a company that helps optometry in some way. And I don't know what that company would be, uh, but I do think there's unmet needs still. I would just try to find where is the eye care space in particular suffering the most and where does it need the most help? Um, and I would try to go and fix that one thing. Um, and, and I think that there's a few different areas where, where the profession could use help. And I don't know, I don't know exactly what that is off the top of my head or like, I don't want to guide anyone in one direction, but it's out there. Yeah. Maybe it's, maybe it lies within covalent creators, right? Might be in there. It might be <laughs> hiding like one of our Easter one egg of our codes. Easter eggs. Now's it probably a good time to, to release another Easter egg code. We've only been okay. doing one a session, but what the heck I'm having Do a lot it. of fun. Do people it. are engaged asking questions so let's uh release another code here so the next easter egg code is drum roll co-management so once Whoa, again all what a capitals <laughs> one word one word co-management uh write it down enter it and you'll enter yourself into um uh, the raffle you get kind of additional entries for these codes so uh, take it with you if you've been kind of tuning in and watching live with us all day. We appreciate it. So thank you. Other questions? Feel free to type them in. Yeah, I think Covalent Creators is going to be really unique. We've got a ton of projects we'll be putting online next week, um, and that's going to be a great way for folks to get involved. Um, we'll see. I mean, uh, I, I think it's very interesting to see that a lot of in-person shows are now kind of canceled for the year for the most part. 
So, you know, I would really focus on your online strategy to reach out to people. It may be a better time than, than ever to get a LinkedIn sales navigator, that type of stuff to start to reach out to companies and build relationships. I'd also say a hack is just to provide value without being paid for it. Uh, if I think back, you know, that's a lot of what I did was just, hey, I'm just doing this for free, doing this to help. And then, you know, the, the money follows. And so, you know, one of our core values here is create value to receive value at our company. And it's how you create first and you receive second. It's, it's how you're a good, you know, we have that because we're an agency in, in a sense, you know, and uh, we've just seen that, yeah, Gary V type of stuff, but we, we've seen that be successful and, you know, try to find ways where you can help companies out. They will ask you in return for, for your support, for compensation. Um, and I, I think that's fantastic. You know, another thing you may want to think through is, is back to kind of what I just said, but like, who is your mastermind group of friends? Do you have anyone that you know well that's talented in some particular area? And start coming together as a collective to think through those ideas. I don't think that anyone should operate in a, in a, one, in a one person shell. I mean, Covenant Careers was created, you know, originally uh, Brett Kestenbaum, who's fantastic in the finance space, uh, Josh, who's fantastic in the engineering space, Antonio, fantastic in client services, writing space. So who are your friends? What are they good at? You know, think deep, think deep as to what they're good at. Find their like kind of natural abilities and help to bring those to fruition. And if your first company fails, who cares? You know, all you need is one. All you need is one idea to get to, to, to have it win. Uh, I think another big question we get is kind of like, well, what idea should I do? What should I, you know, I don't know what to, what to do. What do I do, right? What idea do I come up with? And I think my biggest tip there is to just kind of follow what your natural passion is. Believe it or not, a lot of this like agency type of marketing media stuff got was created because I was really interested in like filming my friends and I doing bike riding tricks when we were really young. And that's like, <laughs> to be honest, like a big part of how, you know, cause we made websites, we made t-shirts, we, we wrote obnoxious blog art. I don't know what it was and it just cascaded. So what is the thing that you do and you've always done well and how do you bring that into optometry? You'd be surprised how much value you can provide through that. My YouTube channel is a creative outlet for my friends and I exactly yeah, for you sure. Know, find that thing. TikTok dances, right? Yep. Yeah, there, there you go. I don't know how to do them, but <laughs> TikTok channel. Always, always, always room to learn, right? Yeah, 100%. So recovering. Awesome, yeah. Well, in the, in the few minutes we have left, I'm not sure if anyone has any final sort of questions. Uh, you know, feel free to, to type away. If not, you can obviously contact us um, just through email or, or hook up with our recruiters or team members at the COVID and careers booth. And, you know, they'll, they'll be glad to help you out or send your messages along, but um, yeah, let's talk about tomorrow. Maybe what's to come and, and all those that are more non-clinical questions, feel free to just reach out to us through the chat on the website. Happy to answer them and keep in mind covalent creators. If you want, anything related to non-clinical, please log on there and create your account. We're going to start funneling 100% of all of our projects through that site. I don't know how many are live right now. A couple dozen would be my guess. And we are launching a new feature soon. So you could search those projects. We're going to start publishing more content on this stuff. And if you scroll to the top of the YouTube chat, there's three articles that our managing editor posted at the very top of the, of the page for stuff we've done on non-clinical content. Um, as well. I hope this was helpful. Yeah. Antonio, what's going down tomorrow? We would love for Man, everyone to continue, continue to try to break our live chat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We've got a lot of great stuff tomorrow. Um, a jam packed day, quite honestly, where you can obviously see the, uh, the entire schedule at the, in the education lobby, even in the, uh, you know, the main page there, it's listed out, but I mean, we're going to be talking finances, uh, during and after COVID-19, right? So a lot of people are interested in that kind of what to do, how to manage finances. Uh, we'll be talking the state of optometry jobs, what that looks like both now and into the future. What are some trends? Um, what it's like working with uh, various organizations, maybe who are hiring now or hiring in the future. We're going to be talking side gigs during practice closures. So kind of uh, tying in this non-clinical talk, right? We'll be talking to someone who does a lot of this stuff kind of um, on the side, but incorporates it into her daily sort of schedule. So you'll be able to, to find out a little bit about that. We'll be talking specialties, modalities, um, 
things to avoid, you know, rookie mistakes, so to speak. And um, an interesting or super interesting one for those of you who are interested in opening cold, uh, I Care Advisors is going to be joining us. Uh, our good friends Bob Steinmetz and, and Eric Bass will be kind of hopping on and talking about opening cold, right? Who would have ever thought? Make there sure to be come potential to that opportunity. One. Yeah, you definitely want to check that one out. It's going to be great. They have a booth and, here too, so you can talk with them tomorrow. They'll be online. Yep. And we'll have some other good interviews kind of sprinkled in between. So, you know, come tune in. And as far as uh, today's content goes and videos and streams, um, everyone should be able to uh, watch these uh, afterwards. Correct, Matt? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we will be creating all these post-production and getting them onto our YouTube channel and articles and all that coming soon. Yeah, for sure. And uh, obviously, of course, if you haven't, make sure you're uh, visiting all of the exhibitor booths and checking in because they'll enter into uh, raffles. Obviously, uh, I'll be releasing some more Easter eggs uh, throughout the day. So, you know, write them down, enter the codes and um, looking forward to tomorrow. I'm looking forward to it. We start at what time tomorrow, Antonio? 8 a.m. 8 a.m. Pacific. Pacific. Yep. And okay. 11 a.m. Eastern. So, and we've got some good stuff. So make sure you jump in and uh, really just wanted to thank everyone for really joining us today. I mean, we've got some awesome, awesome fans and users and colleagues who have all kind of contributed to this in different ways. So thanks. Thanks just to you a, guys. Just a quick correction here. I don't know who from our team said you can't submit an idea through Covalent Creators, but you can. You can. Just go on Covalent Creators. There's a big submit an idea button at the top. So submit your ideas. <laughs> yep. There you go. But um, search, project search, searching what is in the database is coming soon. Right now, it's invite. We will invite you to projects based on what we see in your profile. Search is coming soon. You can submit an idea. So, yes, and see you tomorrow. Sorry to cut you off. All right. No, no worries. That's all, that's all I got. My voice is parched after I'm, several hours of speaking. I'm, <laughs> this guy did a great job. It's, it's time to call it. So uh, thanks, everyone. We'll see you guys tomorrow. See you guys tomorrow. Thank you.